Pelleggi Technical Services, your computers and electronics concierge service. Welcome back. Well, since I'm on a nostalgia kick, I decided, you know, I have a couple computers lying around and they're Windows XP machines, so why don't I just take them, take the uh, better parts out of the two, build them into, you know, like a Frankenstein machine. So with that, I dug these two machines out of my pile. I do have a couple of these. Uh, there's a one step up that I use as a Windows 7 machine, as like a tech desk, and then I have these guys, which I got recently. So I wasn't sure what to do with them, and now I know what I'm going to do. They're actually both licensed for Windows XP Professional, which is great. I have the Dell Restore disk for that, so I can just throw that on, no problem. And we'll go over some of the differences. We'll call this one PCA, and this one's PCB. PCA is a Dell Dimension 2400. It's running an Intel Pentium 4 at 2.8 gigahertz. It doesn't have hyper-threading capabilities. Um, it does have 512 kilobytes of cache, and it's running at 533 megahertz on the front side bus. It does have 2 gigabytes of memory, which is great. It's DDR RAM, it's the old style, at 333 megahertz. Um, that machine, that's pretty much the maximum it can go. The processor I can do a 3.06 meg. Um, Mega, uh, mega gigahertz, sorry, but that one it's really not worth the jump. It does have an 80 gigabyte hard drive, which is nice. It, it does have a DVD drive and a CDRW. There is no floppy though, and it does have a Sound Blaster Live. Um, it does have Intel um, the 3D Extreme graphics, which is a 128 megabyte video um, memory on that one, which I can't really change unless I put a PCI card in it. PCB, on the other hand, that's a uh, Dimension 3000. That's running a Pentium 4 at 3.2 gigahertz. That does have hyper-threading. That is the machine maximum for that. Um, that has a 800 megahertz front side bus and one megabyte of cache. This is also, um, between the two, this is a version A05 BIOS. This is an A03. I'm not sure if this is upgradable to a more recent BIOS or not. I have to check that out. This one only has a uh, gigabyte memory, so I actually looked it up. I can switch the memory over to this one, which is great. Uh, it does have the floppy drive, which I actually kind of like for being real retro, but it only has a 40 gigabyte hard drive. And you can see it doesn't have a DVD drive either, which is not as useful. Um, this has the Intel Extreme Graphics 2. I got to look up the specs between the two, see which one's better. I'm assuming it's going to be this one. They both have 10100 Ethernet, which is standard. This one does have a modem. I don't really need that, so I'm probably going to pull that. And um, that's really pretty much it out of the two that I can find. So that being said, we're going to take the hard drive out of this one, the memory out of this one, the sound card out of this one, put them into here. I'm also going to take the DVD drive out of it and put it into here. And then that'll be pretty much scrapped out. Now I can use the uh, both hard drives and just use the bracket from this. Not sure what I'm going to do with that yet. I don't really need a whole lot of space because I'm only going to put a couple, you know, retro games on this. Um, yeah. And I'll just start pulling this all apart. Now these things are, are a bit dusty. So I'm going to have to be careful with that. Not to get it all over the place. Basically there's little tabs in the front here. And they just pop up and you can remove the front cover here. And that'll be the same for both machines. And then it's just a matter of getting all these screws out here to pull the hard drive, uh, floppy drive out. And the hard drive is actually mounted down here in a little bracket. All the power cables are going to get disconnected. I'm just going to pull them out the way. And I'm going to do that on both machines and I'll be right with you. Well, on PCA, I went ahead and pulled out the RAM. Pulling out RAM is just a matter of pulling these two tabs outward. And then it basically just pops up and you pull it out. Now I did notice that this is dual channel RAM, which is great. This computer actually didn't have an option for the dual channel, whereas the other one did. So hopefully when I put this in, that BIOS will recognize the fact that now is dual channel. You get a little bit of a performance gain out of that. And then as you can see, here's that Sound Blaster Live card. I've always liked the way that Sound Blaster did their cards back in the day with this black circuit board. It's pretty great. Uh, it does have the classic game port. I don't have any controllers for that, but again, this is going to be a retro computer, so I'm glad it does have that. It does have the digital output, which is nice. Um, 
yeah, these were all around pretty good cards. These were specific to Dell. They had uh, this header on it, which went to the front panel audio. And uh, it's actually nice because it's the same connector on the other computer that went to the motherboard, which is nice. You can see from the back of the computer here, they actually had this little piece of plastic to cover over the ports. I'm actually going to take that off and use it on the other machine as well. And other than that, they look identical from the back. Should also mention now we're going to go up here and take out the optical drives. I haven't really decided yet still what I want to do with this machine. Half of me is leaning towards putting the rest of the pieces back in it. Half of me is just leaning towards not bothering with it and just leaving it as a scrap machine. Not 100% sure what I want to do yet. So I'm just going to take it kind of all apart for now. Um, it kind of has to be taken out that way anyway. Uh, some of these pieces for the most part, but for the rest of it, it's, it's okay. It'll come out as I need it. One thing that's important to mention about these old IDE drives is where to set the jumper down here. It's pretty easy depending on what machine it is though. This one is cable select, this is slave, and this is master. Some of these require one to be a master and the secondary drive to be the slave. Some of these can be set to cable select and depending on which position the cable is determines which one's master slave. Uh, this machine it's already set for cable select. I'm going to check out the other machine, see if that's the same situation. I'm pretty sure it will be. If that's the case, that's great. I could just plug in the connector. And here's what I mean. The top one would be master. The secondary one would be slave. And I even mentioned that it's drive zero and then drive one. Here's a sneaky little trick about how to get the hard drive out. There's a screw right here holding this cage in. There's also another screw down the bottom here too. They both have to be taken out. This one's holding the cage in from the bottom, this one's holding it from the side. Once you take this bottom one out here, the cage will come a little freer. And then you can take the next one out the side here. Which will allow the cage to be swung right out. And you actually want to do that from the bottom. Like that. And then you can take the whole thing out. Now the way these are designed, you can see there's tabs here and here. These tabs will, are the same location basically on, on each of these um, cages. So you can actually get another one of these from another machine if you want and just piggyback it right on. You can actually see there's another hole here just like this one. Uh, I actually have done that before in the past with some of these older machines. Here's a Relic, an old Maxter hard drive. I think Seagate owns Maxter now if I remember correctly. All right, now the computer A has been completely tore apart for the parts I need out of it at least. We can focus on computer B over here now. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to take that modem out of it. I don't really need that. I have no reason to dial up to anything honestly, so it's not going, not going to be useful to me. Pulling the memory out, I'm going to put the, obviously, two in here from the other machine. The two, gigabyte, uh, two, two gigabytes. I have uh, <clears throat> already started taking out the stuff over here that we need to get out of the way. I did go rummaging through my pile of stuff and found another Maxter 80 gigabyte hard drive. So if I want, I can piggyback the two in here. Not really sure if I'll need that or not again. 80 gigabytes is more than plenty for what I'm looking to do with this machine. Because after all, like I said, it's just going to be Windows XP and a couple of little classic games. In fact, they may not even go on the internet. So, I'm going to start putting this back together try to clean it as best as I can for now. Ultimately it has to be taken outside to the shed and be blown out with the air compressor. That's a you know project for another night. It's kind of laid out. Can't do that right now. And I'm just going to go ahead and put this together. I got the memory out of here but unfortunately one of the pins broke. This is the uh, little retention clip I should say that sits over here. This is what holds the edge of the memory in. And when I went to push this back, it just snapped right off like there was nothing to it. You can see it broke right off. Here's one of the hinge points there. And there is a little piece you can't see out in the camera because of the angle, but there is a little piece in there that I'm going to have to fish out. Fortunately, I do actually have another motherboard just like this from a machine that I've always scrapped. I've gotten tons of these and 
for some reason handed to me over the years. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull that off of the other board and stick it in and it'll be good to go. Good as new. Now it's time to put this all back together and since I'm already zoomed in on the memory I might as well start with that. So what we're going to do is just take the new memory which again is two gigabytes. It's two one gigabyte chips. Here they are here. This is a, come on focus. This is a no name brand. I've never really heard of them myself. I don't really recognize the logo. But at least the uh, brand is the people who make the chips it seems like. Well, that's kind of good. Now the way this memory goes in, there is a little key slot, and you can see over here, this is where those little retention clips fit into. So when you put this in, you want to make sure you match up the key slots. I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera, but right here, maybe if I zoom in, right there is the little key slot, um, key that I'm talking about. You can see how that fits in there. This should be the right orientation. I move my hand out of the way. Yes. And if I move over, get that retention clip in the frame. You can see once I push this down, it's going to kind of want to go in on its own. It's going to clip. You're going to want to do that on both sides. And that's how you know the memory's in, basically. You're just going to grab the other stick. It's going to have the exact same orientation. You put it in like that. Make sure both sides are lined up and clip it. I always just make sure they're both snubbed up. And that's it. Your memory's in. Of course, once you boot this up, it'll let you know if there's any kind of errors or anything like that. Now we're going to move on to the PCI slots with the Sound Blaster Live card. You can see this is also keyed, but well, I can't really go the other way around because this has to face out because that's where your ports are. So this is going to go in like that. This piece up here is going to fit up here in a little slot. The top up here is going to get screwed in on the top. And when you put these in, you want to make sure you put them in evenly. So that all the pins make sure they connect right. And you can kind of wiggle it in like that. And that's it. Now sometimes... When these boards are brand new, this goes in a little harder. This may have had something inserted in it before, I'm not really sure. That's just going to get a screw up here on the top. There's only one place it goes. If you uh, have a magnetized head like I do, it's great. Just make sure you don't put it near the hard drive. Of course, you need a pretty powerful magnet pretty close to do any real damage. But that's not to take any precautions. So that just gets screwed in like that and of course we have the center piece over here there's another wire for this audio now this actually has to come off the board here and get hooked onto here because we're going with this new card and once we get the computer booted we're going to have to go into the bio settings and disable the onboard audio now we're going to move along to the optical drives. Now, these have a screw in here. This is a special screw, which is going to allow this to slide along a rail. You can see there's one on both sides here. Again, pardon the dust. You can see it's a bit dirty. Uh, we're going to put the DVD, the DVD drive on top, like this. And it can really only go one way you'll see that this is just going to slide in a certain way and it can only go so far because of those screws. I'm going to do the same thing over here with the regular CD burner underneath it. And then we're going to leave the floppy. There's two screws here that are going to get screwed in. Um, and then it's just a matter of connecting the cables and the top one's going to be the master, the bottom one's going to be the slave. They just get hooked up just like this. Again, this is a keyed connector. Can't go in another way. You can see there's even a blocked out socket right here. You'll notice in the back of these when you look at it, there's a pin missing there too. And then as far as the power supply goes, they're just going to get these connectors here. Just your standard Molex connector. And then the floppy drive is going to get this. No real reason showing that because it's just plugging in a connector. 
I'm sure you'll get the idea. One important thing to mention too now when putting this together is there are two different kinds of screws. And let's see if I can get the camera to focus again on this. This one over here is a little bit of a coarser thread than the one on this side. However, they'll both fit in the same hole. And it depends on which device you're using is which screw they go into. I find that a lot of times the hard drives and the case pieces use these you know coarser th uh, threads whereas the CD-ROMs most of that stuff the floppy drives things like that have uh, threaded screw holes and they use these finer through uh, threads also so does the motherboard screws they use a finer thread and I point that out because sometimes you'll go to screw these in and you have a heck of a time getting the hole started and that's why you're using the wrong thread onto the hard drive it's just the reverse of before we're going to head and use these tabs to mount this into these slots here they bounce like that make sure there's no wires in the way and it just folds forward and that's it screw gets screwed in down here slightly off camera also the screw in the bottom gets screwed in connect the wire to the top the power connector that's pretty much done now another thing to point out the wires that they use for uh, the CD-ROMs are a little different than the ones they use for the hard drives and if you look at they have the exact same amount of pins they both fit in the same connection but the wire that they use for the hard drive has more conductors there's more actual wires in this and uh, I'm sorry my memory escapes me right now I don't remember what this type of cable is called um, ultra IDE maybe I could be completely wrong by that I'm <laughs> I used to be really great with this older stuff but man now that I'm using SATA connections and you know everything's a lot different nowadays and I'm a little more used to that again I'm used to Windows 7 a little bit better with Windows 10 now than I was uh, back in the day I was a whiz with Windows XP before that I was a win was a whiz with Windows 95 and Windows 3.1 you know as you get older and systems get different and you kind of tend to forget about some of this older stuff but there is rudimentary things that are the same so I'm sorry my memory escaping me for what that you know 80 I think it's like 80 wire versus 40 wire or something like that I'll put it up on the screen or somewhere in the description below what kind of wire that's called and basically once you connect those that's it we're just gonna put the front faceplate back on this and slap it together and get it powered up and see what happens the moment of truth is upon us push the button Ooh. Ooh, it wants to load Windows already. Well, we don't want that. Let's reboot this and get into BIOS here and see what we have. And you can indeed see it is a Pentium 4, 3.2 gigahertz. With one megabyte cache, great. It is about 11 o'clock at night. It is December 10th, yep, great. We're going to check out the hard drive configuration. You have the floor, hard drive, floppy drive still here. Hard drive, 80 gigabyte, great. Um, for some reason, this drive is not coming up. Let's see, we'll set this to auto here. And I'll try rebooting the machine and see what happens. Let's uh, escape and save changes. Right back into the settings and let's see okay now they're both there so great moving along let's check out the memory oh even better all right we're running for 400 megahertz which is great because it was showing three uh, 333 megahertz in the other machine I didn't actually pay attention to what said in front of it maybe it was 400 megahertz hmm and it is dual channel. Great. So this is going to be a speedy little machine. 
we're at the maximums it can run. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to see if this will boot to Windows because that drive did actually have a clean version of XP put on it. Now why it came up with two different options when it booted up, I'm not sure. I might have to clean that out of the registry. Uh, nonetheless, we're going to get booted into Windows here and see what happens. Now it's probably going to have some initial driver problems, but you know what, in all honesty, I never got the drivers loaded for it anyway. I kind of just left it at that stage. It, does, it did have the Service Pack 3 installation. Okay, yeah, so we're going to get the blue screen to death. No biggie. So the rest of the time I'm going to spend uh, off camera will be just putting the Windows XP installation disk in here, getting this thing up to snuff, get Windows uh, update up to Service Pack 3, and possibly plug it into the internet here and get it up past that point, and get the drivers updated. And that's where I'm going to come back to. I managed to get everything installed without any problems. Uh, usually, using the Windows XP disks that came with these Dell computers, there's usually no problem. You get to the desktop pretty quickly. Uh, that was a Service Pack 2 CD. I did install Service Pack 3, also from a CD that I had burned off of Microsoft's website a long time ago. So it was a great backup to have. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at the desktop. I did get all the drivers I needed from Dell's website. I did have to go back and forth between the um, Dimension 3000 and the Dimension 2400's respective drivers page. Uh, just because, you know, I pulled different parts from the different components and obviously they're not going to be all underneath one machine now. Uh, things like the, the sound card, for example. And uh, yeah, and with that, I didn't have any problems no conflicting drivers you know between the onboard stuff and the uh, added you know PCI card recognize the memory no problem I mentioned that you know it's running at the four, uh, full 400 megahertz which is awesome I actually went through a box of some stuff here and I found some actual 400 megahertz memory so I might just try putting that in there just for funsies and see if it you know does increase the speed a little bit I doubt it will though um, but the important thing is, is I managed to get the game that I wanted on here. It's uh, SimCity 3000. I'm sorry, SimCity 4. Uh, um, it works fine. It works great, perfectly. You know, given that this computer is much older now than most of anything else I have in the room, it's actually funny how it's still pretty relevant. I also went and took. I think it was 8 gigabytes worth of space and created a small partition on the hard drive and called it the D drive. My intention is, is to install DOS onto that and make this into a true, you know, dual platform, I guess you could say, machine where I can play some native DOS games in it with some pretty decent resources for an old DOS machine. Um, that would be great. If not, you know, I could run the default DOS box, which works great. And this will be my... I guess you can call it dedicated gaming computer for retro games. You know, I don't really intend to do anything else with that. Um, like I said, I do have a Windows 7 machine here that also serves a similar purpose, but I use it more for the uh, technical services part of it where I'm using it to download drivers or download files for people or for their computers, like whatever stuff I'm working on. I can plug hard drives into it. You know, I have it set up like that for a specific reason. But again, if I need a Windows 7 environment, I have that. Now, I won't necessarily be doing any of the last minute updates that they had for this XP because I believe the security system verification uh, problem that I'm having with the Windows 7 and the Windows 10 machines here may be fixed, fixed, if you will, um, on Windows XP with some kind of an update and I don't want that update because I want to be able to play those games and stuff so yeah I'm not gonna do those updates uh, and likewise I don't ever intend on hooking this particular computer up to the internet I have more than enough devices connected to the internet here I don't need another one it serves me no purpose other than downloading stuff to it but I do have a connected um, 
I can connect it internally to my network, um, which I could use to transfer files that way if I really want, but most of the time I'm just going to put them on a thumb drive and just plug it in and do it that way just to keep it you know, segregated from the rest of the system here. There's no need to connect it. Um, but with that, that's enough for this video. I will have other projects I'll be working on. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button down there. Also leave a comment if you have any questions about anything. I can also try to help you out with that. And thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more.